Hello, friends. You know me. This is my BFF since way back in the day. This is Kate. <laughs> Kate is like a bad bitch, but like nobody knows it. But Kate, tell me about yourself. What's your job? Why do we love you? Thank you. I'm honored to be on your program today. I have known Ali since we were in high school. Yep. Um, I'm currently an attorney. I work in downtown Frederick. Mm-hmm. I work at the law firm of Etheridge Quinn. I we have a lot of names. We have a lot of Etheridge Quinn, Kemp, Rowan, and Hartinger. So Got there's it. a lot of names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our website is EQ Lawyers. It's a little bit easier. So I've worked there for close to eight years now. And I practice civil litigation primarily. So I do estate prep. I do family law, um, business litigation. Pretty much the only thing I don't personally handle is criminal law, but there are plenty of attorneys in our law firm who handle that. Plenty of criminals out there to go around. <laughs> We're currently at the Derby drinking yeah. lime in the coconut. One Delicious. That's right. Mm, 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 mm. So um, I also have two kids. She does. Very close in age to Allie's kids. Yes. Um, my little one, Hannah, is four and Mary is six. So I'm a mom, and then my husband Dan. We live in um, close to Newmarket, not very close to Newmarket. That's why we're here at the Derby. Today. That's why we're here. We love the Derby. <laughs> so Kate and I have been discussing a lot how our parents, our friends of our parents, and just anybody is coming to us, even people who are our friend, our age, in our friend group, who might be going through, through some divorce issues or some family law issues, and they come to us separately but then you know i'll be like okay oh, i talked to so and so and she'll be like oh yeah i talked to them months ago and so we decided that we would come together and sort of talk about how real estate and family law intersect and how you can kind of cya definitely big time cya in order to protect yourself and um get these issues taken care of in an expedited manner before it becomes a problem because most times once you're all the way part way halfway in it's too late to yes. kind of figure out what's going on. So if you have any sort of issues with family, that can be estates, that could be divorce, custody, anything, watch these videos, watch this series, and we will hopefully save you a whole lot of headache. Right? Absolutely. Here we Cheers go. Cheers to that. Okay. Mm. A lot of people don't understand what a real estate agent's job is. If you were to believe certain larger brokerages that are named after colors and animals... <laughs> <laughs> and that charge less money, they will have you believe that a realtor's only job is to open doors so that you can get inside of a house. But in reality, a realtor is given lawyer privileges for the duration of the contract. So while we're under contract, I am your lawyer, really. Yes, we do have a title attorney. He does the title portion, which is a whole other part. But I am very knowledgeable of the actual contract. Um, and therefore I can help you with things in the contract. Now, sometimes then I will talk about it with Kate and I'll be like, oh, that's really like a legal term. I just thought it was a real estate term. (laughs) I'm very knowledgeable of the law within the real estate contract, not even like a contract law. That's a whole different thing. I'm just knowledgeable of the real estate contract. She gets paid the big bucks and she paid the big bucks to go to school to be knowledgeable in lots more different kinds of contracts and lots more different kinds of things, right? Right. Yeah. So Kate and I were first discussing how... Mediation is best. That's just going to be our first category today. Mediation is best. Kate, talk to us about how mediation works in family law and why it is preferred. Absolutely. So a lot of times people will call me and they will say that they and their partner are considering a divorce or separation. They call an attorney, which is always a good first step. But I will tell everyone that litigation, as you can imagine, is awful on the family. Um, It's tough if you have kids, it's tough, you know, you're dealing with your partner, with your spouse. So there are a lot of issues that come up initially that can be dealt with with a mediator. So a mediator in general, if you don't know, is a neutral third party. It might be an attorney who's practicing in the community and he offers those services for compensation. It might be a retired judge sometimes, especially if you've already filed litigation and you're sent for mediation, it might be a retired judge. The other option that a lot of people don't know about is the family law clinic that's in the courthouse. So this is specific to Frederick County right now, but there's one from Montgomery County too. Every county has this service. 
So you can go to the courthouse, you can go to their website, and you can get some free services initially. Um, they will evaluate. They don't necessarily give legal advice, but they have forms available, and they'll also set you up for in-house mediation. So the cost of mediation ranges. It varies greatly. If you're going to do something in-house with the court, um, the cost is much lower. If you go to a private attorney, you're going to be charged hourly, and it could be a couple of hundred dollars an hour. Out the wazoo. Yeah, so it kind of depends on your case, though. If you have a lot of complicated issues, you have a lot of assets, um, you fear that it might be um, sort of an unhappy situation, and not as easily worked out, then you might want to go to somebody who has a little bit more experience. You pay for an attorney who does this regularly and can tell you what you'll expect in court. Great. Well, on our side in real estate, when people say, I'm going to sue this person because about three years later they find an issue with the house, um, we often suggest mediation just because most of the time, unfortunately, you, the person who's saying, I'm going to sue this person, you don't have a case. It's very hard to prove that the seller had actual knowledge. Like, we have to have evidence showing that the seller actually knew about this problem and that they said, screw it, I don't care, I'm going to pass this off to the next person, it's not my problem. That has probably only happened to me three times in over, you know, almost 150 real estate transactions. Three times we've actually made it happen. Once before closing, twice after. But everybody calls me several months after the transaction, something happens, and they say, I'm going to sue the seller. And everyone says that, but almost nobody ever sues them. Why? Because you don't have a case. So usually um, it goes to mediation. Um, mediation is also free. You know, it's not worth it for you to spend your money on this to litigate this as, as it is. You know, with your former spouse and all of the assets you've ever um, obtained over the course of a lifetime, that might be a, a little bit more worth it than, you know, when we're talking about a house and these, these issues that are coming up, unless it's something gigantically structural or something like a whole roof on a, you know, very large property, these are usually smaller issues and most of them get taken care of in mediation. Right. And we've handled cases like that. And like Ali said, it has to be something significant. That's actually part of the standard. It's referred to as a latent defect. And it has yes. to be something. Stop. That's my, I know. That's my turn. Oh, I thought you were doing it. Were doing no, it's okay. No, no, no. It's okay. okay. But like, do you? No, it's a legal term. Oh, you thought you made up latent defect? No, 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 no. I was just thinking that latent defect just had to do with real estate. I didn't know that had to do with all. It's a legal standard. No, it is actually a legal standard. Oh, if you show up in court, yeah, you have to prove that it was a latent defect, something that was not apparent to the eye, right? That is actually uh, seriously it infringes on your right to have the house that you thought you were buying. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard standard to obtain. Yes. Um, the only times that we've ever, actually all three times that we've busted our sellers on this has been when my buyer calls a plumber and the plumber's like, we've already been out to that property and we told Mr. So-and-so X, Y, and Z. And just think, what's the chances that you call the exact same plumber or the exact same, we had an exterminator, that you call the exact same service provider that they did? The chances are very low. So those three times, we just so happened to come across the exact same service provider that those people had. Yeah. And then the, oh, no, sorry, two times. And the third time was um, the neighbor came over and told us. <laughs> well, I like the tip that you gave me that I just recently gave a client where um, you look for the stickers. Yes. Yes. So if you're looking at the, um, you know, so if you have a problem with the electrical panel and you're down there and you're like, man, what the hell, what was this person before me doing? Um, look for the stickers in the house, like who came and serviced it, and then you can call them, and they'll be like, they kind of um, are loyal to the property address only. So they'll be like, oh, yeah, man, we came out there, and we told so-and-so this, 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 and this. And I'm like, can you write that in a statement? Thank you, sir. That's so, so smart. Yeah, look for the stickers whenever you're in the house and figure out who was servicing it before. Call them and keep their name, you know, after, even if you decide to use someone else, keep their name in the background just in case you ever do have an issue. Right. And I would say the last tip on the issue with this defect, document everything. I'm sure Ali says the same thing, but pictures are really important. Receipts, don't get rid of anything. In fact, it's really important to talk to an attorney or someone before you start ripping everything out of the walls, of the carpet, of the floor, the foundation, because if you start doing the work without the proof that the problem existed, Mm -hmm. then your case is kind of out. Keep every email. Every email. I still, you know, I have um, every file that I've ever closed, I keep in my archives. And then I'll still get an email. I've gotten an email from like uh, three years ago and I file it and put it in there because 
I don't know when they're going to call me, and I'm going to be a witness either, right? right? There are two different forms that Allie can go more into, but from my limited knowledge of what's happening with real estate, there's a disclosure form and there's a disclaimer form. Three pages versus one page, yes. Okay, so the disclosure form is where you're going to identify any problems that you know about, any defects about the house. Doesn't even have to be problems. Okay. Uh, just the ages of the major systems. You know, oh, okay. you say, like, when was the roof last in place? Uh, you have to say either unknown or you have to tell the last time that you replaced the roof. Okay. Yeah. So you can find that form, which is the disclosure, or you can do the disclaimer, mm -hmm. which is where you're telling the, you're basically not guaranteeing the, what all, what's the language you want to basically, use? Basically, I know nothing, right. but it does say on there, I have no knowledge of latent defects. So you can't really say, I don't know shit about shit. You have to say, right. I know nothing, and I certainly have no knowledge of any latent defects. Okay. So you'll want to look for that when you're yeah. going to, you know, buy your house, that kind of thing. Are they willing to sign the disclosure, or are they yeah. planning a disclaimer? Because you can determine whether or not, how reliable you think their word might be. Yeah. Usually somebody will sign a disclaimer if they haven't lived in the property. They, they, don't, they have no obligation to sign the disclosure if they haven't lived in the property in six months. So if you're buying, like, from an, you know, from an estate, mm -hmm. then... Don't count on knowing any okay. of the ages of the systems of the home. Uh, same thing if it's a rental property, like it was somebody using it their rental, and somebody was the landlord, and then they're selling it. Um, yeah, you're not going to ever find out anything about the property, probably, unless they're being super, super nice out of the goodness of their heart and telling you. Right. But they really don't know because they didn't live there. And it's a good point because a lot of people will come with problems that they discovered after they bought the house, and they say, well here are my forms, and I'm looking for a disclosure, but what I find is a disclaimer. Yep. And so that's much more of an uphill battle. Yeah. yeah. Next week, we are going to be discussing estate planning, like very, very lightly. You know, this is not like we're going to teach you how to write a will or any of that stuff. <laughs> we're going to be talking about estate planning and how to make things a lot easier on you. See ya. See ya. <laughs>